Praise the Lord. I'm, um, I'm just grateful and excited to see a new day uh, from the Lord. And um, thankful for all his, his blessings throughout the week uh, for keeping us. I don't know what kind of week you had. Uh, maybe it was a very good week. I guess every day we get to see a new day anymore. It's a good week. Um, but sometimes days are tougher than others. And I, and I thought about this, um, something that Paul wrote in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, uh, that no matter how things are going, I can always go to the scripture and remember that the Lord is still in charge. But in Philippians chapter 4, 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. And um, so and, and I think about what Paul, he says, your life verse. I like the verse that come after. Oh, well, no yeah, I, I want to share one, one or two of those, too. Um, but but I, I, when I think about what he was going through, particularly in Philippi and for Paul to say, No matter what, he can rejoice. He can always rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord. Now, there may be other things going on, but when we think about what the Lord has done for us, we can rejoice. And so I I rejoice in the Lord always. And then I, I think about some other things. He said, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in Everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He already knows what we need. And um, Sheila was just sharing with me that she prays for the officers of the church. And, and I thank God for that. Uh, because... Um, and for, for the members of the church as well, you know, we pray. And I, I just thank God um, that we can do that, and he knows what we need, and he'll supply our need. But this part I also like. He said, finally, brethren, now whatever's on your mind, whatever's on your mind, you think about these things. Finally, brethren, whatever things, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. And I thank God for that. I thank God for those words of encouragement. And I pray that they'll be an encouragement to you. As we um, get started this morning, I'm going to ask you to bow with me in a word of prayer and thanksgiving. And Father, we do come before you um, with thankful hearts, knowing that it is you who have placed the sun in its orbit and the the earth. Uh, They didn't just happen, but you made them. And you've likewise made us and given us breath and given us health, given us strength, all gifts from you to be able to do uh, the things that you would have us to do this day. We thank you for our families. We thank you for um, our friends and neighbors. We thank you for one another. We thank you above all for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place, that when we were without hope, you provided hope for us. And dear Lord, we thank you that even before we knew you, that you had already paid the great sin debt for our sins and you gave us faith to receive and believe. And so, Father, we are truly grateful that we can indeed rejoice in you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and pray that the spirit of the living God would rejuvenate us and and guide us into all truth as you have given him. Thank you for your word, that we can study your word. And, Father, we pray that you would help us not only to hear and to receive, but to be doers of your word. And uh, we pray that as we study this morning, that we will learn some things uh, about the role of the church in government and uh, what you would have us to do uh, in that role. 
And help us also, dear Lord, we pray to tell others about you, to live for you, uh, that they too may come to know you before it's too late. We ask it all in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Now, we've been, um, I want to thank Sheila for her book, Sheila Banks. Uh, Some way I, I misplaced my book, and I hope to get that soon. But if you would turn to page 209, Excuse me, not 209. We, we hope to get there. Page 208. And we're going to, we're, we're almost uh, through the portion of, of the government. And, and number three on page 208, it talks about God requires a proper response to hostile government. And we talked about these a little bit last week where we talked about a, a government is hostile to the church when it ordains a civil law which clearly opposes a command of God. The Bible illustrates tension between God's law and man's law. In the lives of Moses, we talked about Moses in the first 13 chapters of Exodus, how God told Pharaoh to let his people go through Moses, and Pharaoh resisted. And as a result, uh, God worked through Pharaoh, uh, God worked through Moses to show Pharaoh and the world that there was none like the almighty Yahweh. And uh, and eventually we know what happened. He let Israel go. Uh, We talked about Daniel chapter six. Uh, You remember there um, the uh, the the, um, some of the rulers were jealous of Daniel. And they wanted to make a law because they know they couldn't catch Daniel in any other way um, other than to make a law that he couldn't pray unto any God but to the God that they, unto, um, to the king. And uh, so they caught Daniel praying. He went about and prayed. And we know what happened there, that they threw him into the pit of the lions. The Lord sent an angel to keep Daniel through the night. And when the king came, he asked, uh, Daniel, was your God able to to save you? And he I I believe the king felt that he would, knew that he would. But anyway, we know the story of Daniel. And what happened after that? You remember they all those people who had accused Daniel and their families? They put those to the lions. And before they could even hit the bottom, the lions were crushing them. So God stopped the mouths of lions. We see in Daniel chapter three, we talked about the Hebrew boys where they, too, had a problem with the government, uh, where the King Nebuchadnezzar wanted um, wanted them to bow down to a statue, to uh, uh, an image about 90 feet tall. And they refused. They were only going to worship the true and living God. And they Uh, The king told him to heat up the furnace and some of his own men were killed trying to get the furnace heated fast enough for the king. But we saw another miracle. You remember what that was? What was the miracle? Somebody somebody said it. What, What was the miracle? He was in with them. The king saw four people when he knew he had thrown in three. And the one was who like who? Like Jesus, the son of God. The fourth was like the son of God. So he was with them in the fire. And what happened when they came out of fire? You know, they smelled like fire and smoke and everything, right? Oh, no smoke? No fire? Oh, my goodness. What a mighty God. Amen. You didn't even smell like smoke. You know, if you, I, I remember trying to light up my fireplace sometimes. And, and boy, that's a, that's a trial. Uh, you know, putting wood and trying to light it up. And boy, you got smoke all over the house. And it smells like smoke. But here they went in a heated furnace and didn't get burned. No smoke, no fire. And then we see the Apostle Paul, um, where he went to, in, in Acts chapter 24 and 26. Let me just...
Uh, we see here that um, they wanted to arrest Daniel because he believed in the truth of the resurrection. And there were men who came to kill him because he preached he preached that against the against against the Jews, the Jews, his own people. But at one time, Daniel was one. I mean, Daniel, uh, Paul was one of them. And now they were trying to kill him. So these are just a few verses. Uh, Acts chapter 24, 14 and 15. He said, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way that they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all the things which are written in the law and in the prophets and have hope toward God that they themselves also allow that they shall that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and of the unjust. And they believed that in the Old Testament, that there would be a resurrection. Isaiah wrote about it. Um, I didn't look up the scripture, but I, it's around Isaiah 26, I think, somewhere. It's one of the book of Isaiah's. I can look it up for you. But not only Isaiah, but Daniel talked about it. And Job did, Job did as well. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, Daniel, I mean, uh, David, he said he would not leave his body to see corruption. He believed in a resurrection as well. So in the Old Testament, they believed in the resurrection. Um, and it was for that reason that Paul says that they wanted to kill him. And uh, be, because of Paul had the opportunity in Acts chapter 25, verse 21, he said, but when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Paul made an appeal to Caesar, and that's because... Um, he, he, he had a right to do so. So we, the, the point that all of, these, all of these scriptures are making is that there is a time when, when um, the, the government, a government is hostile to the church and it talks about uh, there's a time when it ordains a civil law which opposes a command of God. Now, we've seen that in our, right here in our own lifetime, right here in the last year or two. Uh, with the same sex marriage proposal that goes against everything God said. That two people of the same sex can marry. Now, how ludicrous is that? Um, and no telling what's coming down the pike. But a man can marry a man. And a woman can marry a woman, woman, and they can't produce a child. And uh, so it's a, it's a, it, it'll be, it'll bring judgment. This is what it's going to do. The um, so I want you to take a look with me in the next part of that paragraph, where it says. Oh, one more thing before we get that far. Uh, the, uh, the author points out that we need to remember that Paul wrote Romans 13 verses 1 to 7 when Nero was ruling the Roman Empire. Nero was ruling the Roman Empire. And Nero, you remember what kind of emperor he was? You remember one of the thing, characteristics about Nero? What did he do? And played the violin while the city burned. And what did he do? Why was that so crucial? Who did he blame for it? He blamed the Christians. And what was the result by blaming the Christians? That's right. The Christians were persecuted. Christians were persecuted. Some were set on fire. Um, so but yet Paul wrote this, wrote some of these um, these laws, uh, Romans 13, which we've looked at at different times um, during the time of Nero. 
And, and what should the church do when government demands the breaking of God's law? So that's where we are uh, today. We've talked about a lot of this before. And so now we want to take a look, uh, if you will, at the next paragraph. And would somebody read for us? And again, I encourage you to, if you have a comment, if um, uh, the Lord has laid, laid something in your heart regarding the lesson, uh, share it with the class that we all may be edified. Uh, so would someone read the paragraph the Bible indicates? Okay, thank you. And the next paragraph talks about, but Christians today must recognize the spirit in which these men disobeyed the governmental authority. Uh, we just talked about some of them. Uh, Daniel, the Hebrew boys, um, Moses. Uh, one we didn't talk about was Peter, Peter and James. But we'll get to them in a moment. But it says, but Christians today must recognize the spirit in which these men disobeyed the governmental authority. Daniel's attitude was one of humility and submission as he descended into the den of lions. Daniel's friends walked willingly into the fiery furnace. Paul patiently waited for the executioner who would usher him into the presence of his savior. We must be willing to stand for God. And still respect the government authority, even in their persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. Just read that again. We must be willing to stand for God and still respect the government authority, even in their persecution of the church of Jesus Christ. So does that mean we go out and break the law? No, no, no. we still have to obey the law. And. Um, God will, we leave it in his hands. He will take care of things. Um, it says, if we cannot obey both God and the government, we must obey God. Agree with that? Where do you get that principle from? If It says, if we cannot obey both God and the government, we must obey God. But we must be respectful and willing to take the persecution. So where do we get the principle? Brother Larry? Acts 5.29 says, Peter said we must obey God. Take, let's take us there, Larry. Let's go there. Let's go. Acts chapter 5. Matter of fact... Before I get to five, I think I want to go to four. Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter four. Beginning of verse 13. Now, you will remember a lot of this because Peter had been out preaching and in verse 13, in verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8, talks about, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day be examined of the good deed of the impotent man, by what means he was made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. And um, he, he, he goes on to talk about this is the stone which uh, was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. That is something they should have recognized because that was Old Testament. So what we see here in verse 13 is that Peter and John says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. 
And down here in verse 17, um, verse 16, it says, uh, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle have been done by them is manifested to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. But that is spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. Now we're seeing that today. What, what's going on, Mike? What are we seeing? Have you maybe you heard recently? Yeah. Well, what are we seeing? Um, I don't know if I remember it all, but recently they, a small town in the West uh, wanted to have prayer mm -hmm. before their city council mm -hmm. meeting, and some of the residents of the town are suing to stop it. Uh, and the, but the town's lawyer is saying. Congress opens up meetings mm -hmm. for prayer. Why can't the city council of the town? Right. So they're even trying to just stop, stop you from having prayer everywhere. Exactly. And I read a, another article about, a, I believe it was a bus driver. And he had a couple of jobs and he, uh, he, he prayed for the kids on the bus. Yes. And they wanted to stop him from praying anymore. On the bus, Supreme Court is going to take up that issue uh, about praying. Now, they need prayer. If anybody needs prayer, they need prayer. And yet, they're going to stop people from praying. I don't know if they pray at the Supreme Court. Uh, I know they do at Congress. Uh, but now they're talking about taking out prayer. But they did that a long time ago when they stopped it in the schools, too. And we see what happened after that. Um, but it didn't stop prayer in the schools. You get a gunman coming in, you bet you people are going to be praying. Um, so God will get his glory. He will get his glory. But we see but we see the same issues. We see the same issues. But it says here. Um, in verse 18, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have been heard, seen and heard. So when they have further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people uh, for all men glorify God for that uh, which was done. Now we want to go to chapter 5 where Larry was talking about. Let's see. You remember this story? What happened here in uh, chapter 5 where... Um, they had arrested Peter and threw him in prison. And he was he was in prison. And um, and God did something miraculous. You remember you remember that? Look at verse verse. Um, start at verse 17. It says, then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple of the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the Senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And you remember when the officers went to find them, they weren't there because they had been released by the angel. But we see what happened. And this goes back to where Larry was talking about. 
Larry, would you uh, read for us, please, uh, beginning verse 28 to, um, to 33? Go right ahead, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. And we see God intervene again. Okay. So, go ahead. Who has a question? Go ahead, Brother Darnell. Mm hmm. Go ahead. Um, it says um, March uh, the 23rd, 1717. Can you hear? When, when Patrick hear? Henry spoke the uh, no, now famous uh, phrase, Given, give me liberty or give me death, to arouse the Second Virginia Convention to arms against the tyrant of Great Britain. He noted that we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now uh, coming upon us. During the civic years of 1765 and 1776, the American colonies had been forced to endure taxations without representation, searches, and seizures with, without probable cause, the confiscation of firearms, and on and on. Though the colony's leaders had tried to remain loyal to the crown and reconcile their differences, they were finally compelled to break away uh, in the revolt. Uh, Thus, it was the churches that begin the primary uh, source, uh, source that stirred the fires of liberty, telling the colonists that the American, I mean, that the England, English government was usurping their God-given right. The king and the parliament were violating the laws of God. The Founding fathers were convinced that it was their sacred duty to start a revolution to uphold the law of God against the unjust and oppressive laws of man. And the fight for political liberty was seen as a sacred cause because civil liberty was an an elevable right according to God's natural law. The, the New England missionary, uh, missionaries in particular, in particular were devised, I mean, no, uh, decisive in, in rallying the popular moral support for war against England. They pressed, I mean, they pressed their congregation to overthrow King George because they believed that rebellion to tyrants were obedience to God. I mm -hmm. think that was interesting. Okay, so. Um, and then it goes on, it says, um, from many pulpits, ministers recruited troops and strengthened, their, strengthened them in battle with uh, patriotic sermons. 
while the church leaders were well schooled in the fact that the Bible placed great emphasis on due submission to civil authorities, Romans chapter 13, they noted there are also many passages that approve, um, approve resistance to ungodly authority. Amen. For instance, when Apostle Paul was commanded by the Sanhedrin to cease pre preaching that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, Peter boldly arrested, boldly um, asserted, we ought to obey God rather than man, Acts 5, 20, 29. Therefore, it is no coincidence that one of the watchwords of the American Revolution was no king but Jesus. For most of the patriotics, their faith were given the courage to stand on God's word to risk their lives and um, properties to break the tyranny of an unjust human authority. In the Christian worldview, obedience to God took precedence over country and government, and their primarily um, allegiance was to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, okay. Okay, so we see where this country was founded on some of the same principles that we're talking about. Brother Larry, and then, okay, go ahead, uh, Sister Francis. Mm -hmm. Yes. That he could or he couldn't? That he could not? Uh-huh. Sure, I think I do. Yes. Uh, did you want to comment about it? You said you understood. I understand what uh, Sister Francis is saying, and it's the, you know, I think many of us face it in the workplace where, you know, our job is, you know, it's primary to go and work and do our job. Mm -hmm. So what do you, what do you think, Mike? Well, you know, I think that. Um, Let's hear it. Come can, on. Yeah. I'm, okay. well, you know, <laughs> I think we can be a testimony to Christ yeah. and not break the rules of That's the workplace. 
Mm -hmm. And because we can, it's easier for the work, you know, the employer to say, well, here are the rules. If you want to work here, yeah. then right. you right. follow the rules. Mm -hmm. right? And we should. Mm -hmm. right. And if you don't want to follow the rules, then don't work. Right. 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 And, and that's a Christian testimony. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, if the man signed the paper and violated what he signed, because he was saying as a Christian, I agree to do this, right. and that's a poor testimony. Right. Okay. Uh, Sister Dorsey. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Oh, okay. You think he was? Because like others are looking. Okay. Hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, I won't get you, brother. Go ahead, uh, Alex. Good point. Brother Larry? I, I just want to get back to where we were in Scripture. Mm -hmm. Because if you let those slip hands, verse 33 says, when they heard this, they were furious and tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. And so Emilio stepped in and tried to reason with the fellows who were upset about this. Verse 38 of Acts chapter 5 says, And now I say to you, from Emilio, he says, um, I, Now I say to you, keep away from these men. And let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Mm -hmm. And they agreed with him. And when they had called, when they had called for the apostles and had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let him go. Mm -hmm. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease to teach, teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Amen. Amen. Good point. Excellent point. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Sister Francis raised some interesting questions that if, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paula. But uh, going back to the bus driver, the bus driver was a pastor of two churches in his community. So he definitely was, well, I, I believe he was saved. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think he was doing it for his own glory. I think that's what he was doing. He signed the paper, and in the article also said they knew what they were getting. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Well, also, so they hired him to operate under those circumstances. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the time. And even after that, they still gave him the chance to um, keep the job to do. And they accept. That's what I understand. Yeah. Well, see, it sounds like when, when, we're, when we accept a job, we accept it under certain conditions, okay? That, that this man's going to pay us, a woman, and we agree to do certain things. Um, and if we don't do the certain things, then they can let us go, okay? So at that point, we have a, <clears throat> if, if we feel so strongly about what is going on, we have a, a choice to make, okay? We can either do what we get paid to do, or we can violate and get fired. And we know the consequences when it comes. Now, one of the things, when I left that up there, it says, if we cannot obey both God and the government, we must obey God. But, if we, must res but we must be respectful and willing to take the persecution. Amen. So 
if we decide that we don't want to work there, he's not paying us enough, I'm going to do what I want to do, then you know the consequences, right? Go ahead, Brother Mike, you first. Mm-hmm. But in that particular case, the rules changed in the middle of his situation. It wasn't at the beginning mm-hmm. that the rule was mm-hmm. set. It was after. Mm-hmm. They were trying to get him. They were trying to get him. So if you know the rules up front, then we have to respect the law right. and the government. And right. if you don't want to, then go somewhere else. Right? <laughs> Sister Johns? Well, I think that he should have never signed the peace. Mm-hmm. Really? Mm-hmm. You think he would have got the job if he hadn't signed? Might and might not. I think they're having problems hearing you in the back. Okay. Mm-hmm. And she said, well, we can get in touch with you and let you know whether they have a job. And she said, keep calling, I have a job. And you got so the I job. I was honest with her, and I went back, back to what I believed in and what I wanted. Mm-hmm. And she was, I said, I had to do that because I'm a child of God, and I said, I love people, and I love to serve people and do what I can for people. Mm-hmm. I was honest with looking her right in her face, and I, and I left. She said, well, I called you in a couple of days. Okay. Well, good. In that case, you got the job. Right. Um, go ahead. Um, Mm-hmm. Right. 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 Brother Larry had his hand up, and then I will come back to you, Sister. Girl. That's true. Sister Carolyn? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Just a, uh, Clark, did you have your hand up? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Walk behind the law. Not before the law. Okay. Alexis? Yes, um, just like uh, Brother Larry said, I, before I retired, I had a chair sitting next to my desk. And I never, uh, God sent people to me. And that, they sat in that chair, and next thing I knew, we were talking, they opened up, and naturally I brought the Lord into it through the conversation. But but I never went to these people. And I have witnessed to a whole lot of city workers. You know, and and I mean I was I wasn't breaking the law. I mean I wasn't breaking the rules, you know, they were mm-hmm. there after that. Mm-hmm. But but like Brother Larry said, yes, the Lord will send people to you. When you least expect it, and always, it was when I least expected it, mm-hmm. and it was something devastating to that person. But I, I think the Lord just needed to enter, to, to let them know he's present mm-hmm. through me. Mm-hmm. You know? I'm, um, you know, I, I think about the civil rights movement. Uh, that was what we call civil disobedience. Uh, They knew that they were breaking the law. Um, And I don't know about you, I lived in Kentucky back in that day in Louisville, and they had uh, marches, and they would ask, they they were recruiting people. Matter of fact, I was in college during that time. And they were recruiting people to go on the freedom rides and things like that. Uh, I always had a choice. Try to try this out. I'm going to do it or not. Uh, because I knew it was breaking the law. Number one, whether you agree with the law or not, it's the law. Uh, and I chose not to go. Uh, maybe it was fear because, but, or other things, but I knew one thing. You throw some water on me. I wasn't taking it back in that day. You throw whatever you got, <laughs> we're we going to have a problem. So, so I knew it was always best not, not to get involved. Um, but, but that's a decision we have to make. We have to make those decisions on our jobs and, um, or wherever we are, uh, whether we're going to obey the law or not. And, and what God is saying, and what I believe the scripture is telling us, as long, and, and we'll go back and look, review, because we're, we're just about done with this part of it, uh, um, the government. But if we go back to page 206, we see that God set up government for our good. Okay, and I think those are things we have to remember. God instituted government for the welfare of man. We've talked about that. And uh, we also know and understand that um, uh, God is still in charge. He's still in charge. No matter how bad things look. He is still in charge and he will bring judgment. But a lot of these things are done so that he's going to judge by people's works. How you treated people. So so, you know, he has a lot of reasons why things happen. We just need to make sure that we do what we need to do. Obey the law uh, unless it directly you know, uh, where we, we have a situation where, uh, you know, I, I know during the tribulation period, there's coming a time, there's coming a time when as the three boy, three Hebrew boys bowed down or refused to bow down to the image, there's going to be image during the tribulation period. And it says that if you take the mark of the beast, you doomed yourself. So there's a price to pay. And the price is martyrdom. The people during that time will lose their heads if they, if, if they uh, you know, follow Christ. But the time is now to follow Christ. Not wait till the, you go through the tribulation when that hits. The time is now. Come to Jesus. So there is a choice. We do have to make choices. And those are choices that we have to make. And so in that time, during that time, people have to make a choice. 
Are they going to follow the multitude, which are going to take the mark, or are they going to follow Christ? And so um, we have that. We have it's not as dire as that right now, but you know, but but in not here. In some places it is. You look at some of the countries, the foreign countries. They are facing that very thing. They stand up for Christ. They go to church. They carry their Bibles. And you have another group come along, oftentimes Muslim, and they will kill them or burn their churches or what have you. So persecuted Christians all over all over the world. So we do have to pray for them as well. OK, this has been an interesting section about the government. Next time we're going to start the officers of the church on page uh, 209. So you can be studying about that, um, about the officers of the church. And thank you so much for your time. And Father God, we are truly grateful uh, that uh, you established uh, civil government. And dear Lord, you've done it for our good because it helps protect us from those who would do us harm. And uh, we are truly grateful. We pray for our government leaders. Um, we know that in the Old Testament time, you told Israel to speak well of their leaders. And uh, Paul remembered that when he was facing the, um, um, forgot the, the leader uh, uh, of their government. But, Father, we pray that we, too, will pray for our leaders, um, that they would do that which is right and pleasing in your sight. And, Father, that uh, we may use those opportunities that you give us wherever we are to lift up your name, to live for you. And uh, we pray that souls will come to you before it's too late. We thank you for the privilege that we have and the great joy each day you give us. We pray that, you, that we will live for you. And uh, we ask your continued blessings throughout this day uh, for our worship. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.